Okay, so now uh, we come to the first of the uh, formal program here, and Naki Nakisinovic um, is going to be our first speaker, and he's going to give, you, give us an uh, overview of the GEA, and he was the director of this, and, uh, and, and not only was he the director, he was the host to uh, many fantastic meetings uh, at the beautiful Luxembourg Castle. So please welcome Naki. Thank you, Sally. Good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, because it's a West Coast launch of Gaia after we've been planning it for quite a long time, but also because it feels a little bit like a reunion. We have so many authors and reviewers here, so this is really wonderful. And Sally has asked me to give you a brief overview of global energy assessment. What I would like to do is spend a couple of minutes about the organization and process so that you know what it was about and how it came, uh, came to be completed and then present some of the ma main substance from the report. I'll, I'll speak for about 35 minutes. So thank you very much, Sally, for organizing this and I look very much forward to the next two days. Um, I'm showing you the same picture that Sally showed of where the Secretariat was. A global energy assessment was based at IASA in Austria, and I had the privilege of serving uh, as a director from 2006 when it was from its inception, but we spent a couple of years planning it. It did not just occur in 2006 until it was completed last year, and now we are focusing, as you can see, on trying to spread the message of what was achieved. Um, the formal launch was almost a year ago at Rio Plus 20. We felt that it was quite important to have at that event an energy message, and I think what happened in the meantime shows that that was the right idea. Energy needs to be one of the sustainable development goals. Um, at that time when it was launched, we didn't have the full report. It was not published yet, so it was a kind of a pre-launch, if you wish. Uh, it was opened by Kande Yumkela that you see on the, on the left, who is the, uh, the UN um, uh, responsible person in UN for sustainable energy. Um, I'll say a few words about that later. He gave a very, very motivational talk. Then on the left of the small pictures of the panel, you see Jose Goldenberg, who, who was the, the co-president of, of GEA, and I don't think I need to say who he is here from Brazil had many important positions from being a minister of energy, of environment, to being a head of the Brazilian energy company. And Jed Davis, who, who was served as the other co-president, gave the introductory overview at that event that was at the Energy Day at Rio Plus 20. This is how the report looks like. Um, you all have these executive summaries distributed. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to look if you're not familiar with it. There is a three-page, three-plus half a page key messages summary. Very short, was very difficult to write. Then we have a 30-page policymaker summary, a li little bit like IPCC. And then um, uh, a 60-page um, um, technical summary, which is probably of more interest for those of you who are active in academia. So that's the executive report, but that's the, that's the main volume. <laughs> And affectionately, I call it doorstopper. And I don't suggest that too many of you go and acquire this much paper, but it would be a good carbon storage because I hope it'll stay on shelves for a long time. It's 13 pounds, so it's quite heavy. The good news is you can download it from the internet. You see the website above, all of the chapters or the whole volume. Otherwise, it's a commercial book from Cambridge University Press. So let me just say, say a few words about the book because so many of you worked very, very hard on it. Um, 300 authors. Um, so not as big as IPCC, but quite impressive for, for energy study, and 200 anonymous reviewers. I will say a few words about that later. I think this was really an essential part of it. So that differs from IPCC. We had academic review process. It took six years. I think originally we thought naively it could be done in three years. Uh, the funding of six million euros, what is that, about eight, nine million dollars. 
uh, was actually bare bones funding, but essential for meetings. During the six years, there was essentially every week uh, a GEA-related meeting somewhere. I estimate the effort at about 100 person years, but nobody really knows because everybody really worked very hard. And it was labor of love, not paid. It was pro bono for all of the authors. Uh, there were about 6,000 review comments. What well, those of you who are teaching might be interested that there are 1,000 figures and tables, very good material for energy courses. I use it personally in my own teaching and 7,000 up-to-date uh, references, and as you can see, the report is almost 1,900 pages and 13 pounds. Um, the, we are very grateful for the external funding, and as I said, that was exceedingly difficult to achieve. I think this is one of the challenges for the future. I also believe, I may say it, uh, believe that it's not sustainable that we expect experts and scientists con to conduct these assessments for free. Now, people, many of the authors of GEA, about 40, are also working now on the fifth assessment report of IPCC. But the funding was very important. Uh, it came from a number of governments, even though this was a non-governmental process. Uh, while we are in U.S., let me in particular mention the EPA and USDOE. That was really important that we had the support of the Department of Energy in this country. And you can see many other governments, then all of, essentially all of the UN organizations. It sim simply indicates how important energy is becoming on the global agenda. And I think what is also essential in the energy area, a number of private sector supporters. I would just like to highlight Pretobras from Brazil. I'm sure you have been reading about post-salt exploration of oil and things like that. So, But they're also active in the renewables. And then we had World Energy Council and the World Business Council on Sustainable Development as supporting organizations. Um, this was the governing council of GEA. Uh, 27 colleagues served over the years in providing us guidance and direction, as I mentioned, chaired by Jed Davis and Jose Goldenberg. Uh, uh, Robert, uh, Bob Correll was going to be with us. Unfortunately, felt, he felt a little bit sick. He was at the meeting of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Arctic Council in, in Sweden and in, Nor in Norway afterwards, and he got a bug, so he will not join us. But he's doing well. I think he's just a little sick for traveling. Um, so I think we will skip that presentation to just, you know, for orientation, but I just wanted to show who are the people who really guided us through this process. Now, most important, these are the convening lead authors, co-chaired by Thomas Johansson from Sweden and Anand Patvadian from India, who is now actually in U.S., and Anand will be joining us during this meeting and will be giving a talk tomorrow, just that you know. Uh, I have gone through the list a little bit. Um, we had 33 convening lead authors. These are the people who coordinated all of the work that went into the assessment, and 11 are here, one-third, so it is through reunion, plus also many, many of the lead authors and so on, and then you, you will see them and they speak and we'll be able to uh, ask them questions about the chapters that they've been coordinating. But let me say at this point that um, even though colleagues coordinated individual chapters with the writing teams, uh, the point of GEA was really integration across the chapters and many issues because energy cannot be fragmented. Another reason why we decided to go for one large thick report rather than three or four smaller reports that are easier to carry around. So I'll leave my copy here, by the way, so <laughs> I will not take it back to Europe. Um, let me take this opportunity to um, pay tribute to uh, um, one of our authors who unfortunately, sadly, and tragically died on the 4th of April. Um, uh, he worked on the issues of access. Abe Kubru Hammond was a CLA, co-CLA of Chapter 19, together with Shonali Pachauri. Uh, access is one of the key issues at IASA. We are, I think, all really uh, very saddened by this great loss. Sabiku was one of the leading African energy experts, uh, also global energy experts, but in particular in Africa. He's worked very hard and has actually organized, shortly before he passed away, a GEA event, a GEA event in, in, um, in, in Africa at which Thomas Johansson, the co-chair, uh, co uh, spoke. So I wanted to pay tribute to him. There is a website if you want to go and find out a little bit more or make a contribution. Um, but I think he will stay in lasting memory, and his contribution was really seminal to the energy world. 
Here is another a nice picture of Abiko and Shonali, his co-chair. The reason why I picked this picture, you can see Kurt Yeager behind and Chad Davis right behind Abeku, who was our co-president, and then Arnold will be speaking later on the left. I couldn't find a picture with all of the people here, but at least you see some reference in the in the working context. Now perhaps most important part, and I will clearly not go, these are the, the list of 500 people, 300 authors and 200 reviewers. I will just skim through it. It takes three pages here. And let me say that the reviewers were anonymous, and I believe many of the authors who are here still do not know who reviewed their chapter. Even though the re reviewers were very gracious to say who they were, were the, the list is also attributed in the, in the report and in the summaries you have. And if you look on the lower right, there are four names who prefer to stay anonymous, which is, I think, also fine. Uh, so 500 people have worked on it pro bono over the period of six years. And the result is in this big book documented uh, in 25 chapters. And um, we have divided the chapters in four groups, not because we believe energy can be segmented, but simply that these are the major areas on which global en energy assessment work. Uh, the groups of chapter we called clusters. So the first cluster is about the major energy challenges. And I said a few words about the access, but clearly air pollution, climate change, energy security, poverty, eradication. These are all of the issues that are treated in the, in the first set of chapters. The second set of chapters, and you'll hear a little bit about those chapters. You'll also hear about the second set of chapters that look at the options, possibilities, um, resources, renewable potentials, technology options, and in particular I would like to highlight the end use issues in sectors, in transport industry, in buildings, because very often that's neglected in the energy and global energy assessment devoted quite lots of space to that. The third group of chapters, and you'll hear about that as well, is about integrative issues, urbanization, issues of land use, and what we call pathways, a set of scenarios has been developed by the, by the GEA authors, and I will report a little bit about that in the afternoon. And then uh, last, but certainly not least, perhaps most important, are the policy issues. The last set of chapters devoted to the policies and the way forward, what needs to cha change, and the main message, I would say, is quite clear that current energy systems are not commensurate with the challenges we have, that business as usual, these are now my words, it's no option, um, that transformation is required and it needs to be integrated across sectorial approaches and also involving multiple stakeholders and in the process of GEA we try to do that. Now in the key messages, in the short document that you have there, there are 10 key messages and I will just highlight some of them in the rest of my talk as I try to present for you a short overview of the results. I've already said that the major message is that the major transformation is required over the safe, affordable, secure, and environmentally sound energy system, and that there is an urgent need for a strategy, and that they have to be local, national, not just global, uh, to resolve the challenges ahead. Uh, energy access for us was number one. We felt that, that is the most important thing, to provide energy services to those who lack it today, to increase the security at all levels of energy system, reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, you might be surprised, one of the GEA normative goals was to stabilize climate at two degrees. And so all of the pathways that have been developed fulfill that, that criteria, and all of the other goals that are listed here, but in different ways. Um, the re reduction of indoor and outdoor air pollution, or elimination of it, is really essential for, because of its adverse impacts on human health and development and in general. And I would say it's to a large extent, GEA indicates an outcome of providing access and then reducing the risks of the energy systems. All of the energy systems have risks, but you might imagine that after Fukushima, nuclear remained to be a controversial, a controversial issue, but not just nuclear. In, for example, use of biomass for energy with the potential conflicts for food. So there are many, many controversial uh, uh, issues associated with risks of the energy systems. 
Um, at the end, what the writing teams did and all of the authors is to design a set of criteria that provided this normative view of what, how a sustainable future might look like. It has many dimensions, I will not go to it. Let me just mention these, these four that were in the previous slide. Access, universal access to energy, avoidance of uh, dangerous climate change, improving energy security and elimination of air pollution in order to improve health impact. So these are some of the normative goals that were set for the transformation and then the report in the pathways in individual chapters shows what would need to be done in order to achieve this kind of future energy transformation. Uh, so it might not be a surprise to you that um, some of that work has been already relevant, even while colleagues have been writing the report. Um, that 2012 was the year of the sustainable energy for all, of the, declared by the UN, and 2014 will be the decade. So, so there will be quite, a, quite a lots of activities over the next 10 years in, in energy. So in some sense, the report is timely. It is really time to take action. In the global, in the sustainable energy for all, uh, the energy was seen as an important goal, and I hope it will be also become an independent goal in the, in the sustainable development goals that are being negotiated right now. Uh, this goal had three targets, or three, uh, three targets to be achieved. Uh, informed by GEA, number one is universal access by 2030, then doubling energy efficiency improvement. That was a little bit controversial originally. The UN experts wanted to double the efficiency. There was a thermodynamic problem there, <laughs> doubling efficiency of all. So we decided to go for efficiency improvement rate. And the third one is double the share of renewables. Personally, I would have preferred to see doubling the share of zero carbon options, but renewables was more acceptable. So here we are. That, uh, that also implies doubling the share of uh, zero carbon options, so that's fine. Very aspirational and ambitious, uh, but I believe achievable as GEA shows. And this will be now the activity on the way forward. Uh, this is the official website of Sustainable Energy for All, if you're interested in looking. There is quite lots of action. You see these three goals are now official goals, access, renewable energy, and energy efficiency improvement. They, they left improvement out here <laughs> for simplicity. I will not go through the details, but let me just show you what I think is important. Um, this is not another climate negotiations. This is a bottom-up process little bit like GEA was itself. The idea is to have action plans on, on the country and regional level. And there are 77 countries, mostly developing, as you can see from the, from the pie chart, 77 countries that already have action plans in place. And hopefully that will also then cause the investments to flow. There are a number of private sector companies, not just governments, involved in this activity. And um, so I really hope that this is going to be a possible opening for resolving the energy challenges. So let me just focus for a few minutes on the access issue because it's so central to GEA. Uh, the normative goal was to provide electricity and clean cooking fuels by 2030 to everybody. Uh, because that, that has, has many, many benefits, but it will require new institutional ar arrangements, national and regional and local enabling mechanisms, targeted policies. It's a complex issue, including appropriate subsidies and financing. The good news is that the investment requirements, in quotes, is relatively humble, between 40 and 60 billion, that has been estimated by per year. Uh, to, through 2030, um, and it's important to uh, provide access because in, in particular women and children have to collect food, uh, fuel, wood, and water, and also suffer indoor air pollution, and this is a major way to avoid health problems. It is estimated that about four, and uh, Kirk Smith can correct me if I'm wrong, that about uh, four million people die prematurely per year, mostly women and children, from indoor air pollution associated with cooking with solid fuels. And um, that's four times as much as a malaria, just to put it in perspective. Now, <clears throat> in Gaia, and I'll be very brief, um, we show historical examples that it, it can be done. It's doable if you have the right policies. 
as we are in US, US is the first case on the left. This is percentage of people who have access. You can see in US it has been achieved within 30 years, essentially electrification, very quickly. Mexico, China, Brazil are essentially on the same path. There is a catch up or acceleration even faster, almost universal access. South Africa and India are working very, very hard in that direction. Rural issue is a sub-problem of access because most of the solid fuel use is in the rural areas. And you can see that in US that was done within a decade, essentially, rural electrification. And um, uh, here are the examples of what needs to be done according to the GEA and Sustainable Energy for All assessment in order to achieve the access by 2030. You can see not as fast as US, but, but very challenging and about 40 to 60 billion investment per year. So you might ask, is there enough energy to do that? And I, uh, William Turkenberg will be talking about uh, renewables. Let me just uh, spend a few words on, on fossils. And um, what I've done is I've taken the fossil estimates from global energy assessment and converted them to carbon emissions equivalents. Um, that's not in the report. I've done this. And so that Sally can appreciate how much separation work that might need to be done <laughs> and her colleagues. Uh, so you can see if you want to achieve about uh, two degrees stabilization, we can emit another 850 billion or so carbon. It's a little bit uncertain, the number. And the present content is about 3,000 billion of the atmosphere. That's how much car carbon is there. We have emitted 2,000 billion tons and half of it is airborne still. That means some of the tons that James Watt with his first steam engine emitted are still up there. Now, let's look at uh, oil and gas conventional reserves. That's one, roughly one and a half thousand billion tons if you add the numbers, if you can see them. So about half of what carbon we have in the atmosphere is alone in reserves, as according to the Global Energy Assessment. Biomass above ground is by coincidence about the same amount. Tar sands, huge. Um, uh, huge resources, shale gas, very important in particular in this country, but becoming important everywhere else. Yeah, I put here a range, otherwise all of these numbers are ranges. But you can see that it's about the same amount of carbon is locked in the shales as it is airborne in the atmosphere. So it's a huge amount of carbon. That's coal, and these are the gas hydrates, very uncertain, but also very huge. So the point is that there is, there is no way even if, if we assume very high temperature increases in the future that all of the fossils can be used, uh, and the ones that we'll be using in many pathways are used in conjunction with carbon capture and storage. But there is plenty full of energy, in particular for providing access. That shouldn't be the bottleneck in itself. Um, and there's also renewable, and we'll be talking about that. Let me just highlight something that maybe Arnoff in his talk will be also mentioning. Uh, this shows a map of Europe. Um, that shows that in principle about one third of energy can be produced on site with renewables in Europe. That's the other story, huge amount of renewables, in particular solar energy. This shows the energy density. So all of the areas that are blue and gray, these are the areas where one can generate on site more energy than it's required per same unit area. Orange and yellow are the ones where you need infrastructures and focusing. So it again indicates that we need infrastructures as well as on site facilities uh, also for the renewable energy options. Um, the need for transformation is one of the key conclusions of the global energy assessment, um, and I've already spoken about that. Uh, the transformation will require uh, radical improvements in efficiency. Efficiency is perhaps the most important component. Uh, greater shares of renewables and advanced systems. Uh, there are also many ways to transform energy systems, and I'll show you two before I conclude this brief overview, and uh, perhaps most important is that early, large, and sustained investments will be required, and I'll conclude with that, how large those would be and what kind of policies, Mark will talk, what kind of policies you might need. So the biggest transformation would be occurring on the end use. Uh, what you see here is the share of final energy as it reaches the consumer in percentage. And you can see that in the future, in the GEA pathways, and there is some variation across them, the scenarios that were produced for the global energy assessment, the fossils are phased, uh, the solids are phased out. They're converted either to liquids or to energy gases and electricity. That's 
conducted by grids, and in the middle are the liquids, but even the share of liquids declines, and there is a fundamental transformation on the end use toward electricity and clean energy gases, some of them being produced from renewables. Uh, and there is, as you see on top, also an on-site generation slice. So that's a fundamental change in the structure of the energy system. Uh, this is the history of energy, and now what I will show you is just two examples out of 41 pathways that were developed in GEA that describe this transformative change. I'll show you only two that fulfill the goals of sustainable energy for all. And then in the afternoon, we'll talk about the whole set. So this is the history of energy. We are 80% fossil today. Total energy demand is about 500 exajoules in the world. And you can see the new renewables and nuclear just as a tiny little speck on top of the 80% fossils. At the bottom is the biomass. Also, much of it being used unsustainably by people who do not have the access. Uh, <clears throat> This is one of the pathways. Uh, I'm sh perhaps a little bit on the provocative side. No CCS and no nuclear. Uh, but there is no free lunch. This pathway is possible because of a huge amount of efficiency. It gives you degrees of freedom in case some countries decide not to go CCS and not to go to nuclear, as we have the case in Europe already. But you can see that this kind of pathway also fulfills the sustainable energy for all conditions or goals, uh, but it has 40% improvement of energy efficiency against the baseline. That's a real tall, tall order, and 55% of renewables because there is you have no carbon separation and you have no nuclear. Uh, but the share of biomass is very large, as you can see, uh, exceeding 100 exajoules. Uh, this is probably the upper limit as assessed by the global energy assessment in the land use chapter. Here is another pathway. Um, and let me just compare these two. Also fulfills the, three, the, the goal of the sustainable energy for all, but has a much more balanced energy mix. Again, lots of efficiency. Uh, now 30% renewables by 2030, and that's one of the goals. Uh, you can see that in this scenario, nuclear does indeed play a role, and natural gas a much larger role. Perhaps those are environmentally sustainable shales uh, in conjunction with carbon capture and storage. Uh, in this scenario, there is quite a lot of carbon capture and storage. And what is also important at the bottom, there is also carbon capture from biomass to produce, in quotes, negative emissions, uh, because this kind of pathway this particular pathway overshoots a little bit the two, uh, two degree climate goal, and that's why negative emissions or removal carbon from the removal of carbon from the atmosphere is required. Let me just show you that how that looks regionally. This sub-Saharan Africa in the same pathway, 50% renewables, basically going from from traditional fuels that uh, that about 700 million people in sub-Saharan Africa cook with traditional solid fuels. This would be then more sustainable new renewables. China, another challenge, huge efficiency, and I think what almost looks scary, given how dependent China is on coal, a relative phase out of coal and replacement by new and advanced energy technologies. You see that here also natural gas plays a role. But there's a big variation above the pathways. I'm just showing you one. And then perhaps last, North America, where US is the large chunk, largest chunk of, also about 40% efficiency. And in Europe, <clears throat> even higher in efficiency improvement rate that go along with this scenario. So, as you can see, even the, the, the pathways that are less challenging than the two I've chosen to show you, as extreme cases, all require immediate attention and action in order to avoid the lock-in in, in, of the capital into the old systems and associated infrastructures. Uh, and um, you will hear a little bit about urbanization. That's very important because 50% of global population lives in the cities already, and that will, will probably increase to 70 to 80%. So it's very important how these infrastructures are being built. Um, and here is an example from the urbanization chapter. I, I will be very brief. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor. Uh, on the left, you see in, in percentages, how energy needs of a conventional city will be distributed between the energy sector, buildings in green, and transport in the cities in red. 
and continuously on the right are the cities with ever more energy efficiency and sustainability criteria. All the way on the right is the extreme minimum case where you mostly need energy for buildings and very little for collective transport, but it's one-fifth of what the current cities need. So that shows how huge the potential is. Of course, we will probably not in many cases fulfill the potential, but even doing half of that or one third of that would be a major transformation ahead of us. Um, technology plays a very important role. Um, I just wanted to show you here from the technology chapter just a little bit of a flavor, and I think Arnold will be talking about that in more, more detail later. Uh, these are the so-called experience curves. What you see here are the capital costs in dollars per unit installed capacity for a number of technologies. That was also a big contribution of GEA to provide that information and update it. I just wanted to show you that many of the technologies that we are talking about and the one that's on the continuous upper red curve are the photovoltaics, where we have through an uh, orders of magnitude of cost reductions have achieved 30% reduction per doubling of global capacity. Very, very impressive. But you see that in many other areas uh, that, that these two red curves show 30% cost reduction for doubling the capacity. The things that go up is the cost of nuclear in France and US, where we had substantive cost escalations over the last decades. Uh, very, very high cost. This needs to be avoided in the future across the range of the technologies. Otherwise, this transformation will not be economically attractive and doable from the investment point of view. But this shows quite clearly that large investments would be required in many of these technologies. Um, and I just wanted to share that with you very, very, very briefly. Uh, we will need the portfolio of technologies for this transformation. That's our key findings number 10. Uh, the total investment estimates for the pathways range between 1.7 and 2.2 trillion, so 1,700 billion to 2,200 uh, billion. It's actually easier after the financial crisis to say a trillion nowadays <laughs> because we have given so much money in the guarantees, so in comparison that doesn't look all that expensive, but it is if you look at it at the current compared to the current investment. Current investments are 1,300 uh, billion about into the energy system. So it means 50% increase or doubling. It's in that range depending on the pathway. Um, the good news is, uh, or maybe the bad news is, we give about half a trillion, 500 billion today for energy subsidies, mostly opposing and blocking the transformation. So some redirection of those subsidies would actually provide the financing that would be required. Uh, and then let me also mention that current research and development, as many of you who work in the energy areas know, are quite grossly in a, inadequate compared to those challenges. Uh, I'll show you now just in a second how much they are. I think this is also an important contribution of global energy assessment. On the left, you see the estimates of the research and development in the energy area. And I'm just showing you the three categories of sustainable energy for all, but at the bottom is the total, so the numbers don't add up, don't get worried about that. So in efficiency, we are spending relatively little research and development, renewables a little bit more, access almost nothing, people who do not have access to energy, and total estimate is about 50 billion per year. Uh, one third of that, a little bit more, is public. The rest is from the private sector. Now, what's very important is market formation to achieve those cost reductions I've shown you before. An experiment with new technologies that's a little bit higher, about 150 billion, and the current investments, as I said, are 1,300 billion. Uh, quite a lot of that already going in efficiency and renewables, but still very, very small amount to access, uh, less than a fourth of what would be required, and on the right is the ranges of what would be required to, uh, to achieve this transformation, a major ramp up, ramp up in the investments across the scale, and probably tripling of the market formation and in R&D efforts. So that's basically uh, the conclusion. I, I think uh, I, I'll just have two more slides that I wanted to share with you very briefly before stopping. 
and giving you time for some questions if you have. <clears throat> but um, the, I think one of the important points of global energy assessment is not only that we have to invest to achieve a sustainable future, but also that there would be multiple benefits of this transformation for environment, for economic development, and for social benefits. So I wanted to share that with you. This is, again, um, not directly from the global energy assessment, but based on a recent publication of my colleagues who have used the work of of the global energy assessment to derive some stronger policy implications. And I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, what would be the, the cost of improving energy security worldwide? That, that was on the order of about 0.1% to 2.2% of the global GDP. Air pollution, uh, avoidance of air pollution about 0.5%. Climate change on the order of less than 1%. And, but if you resolve all of those issues simultaneously, then the cost would be only marginally about of the cost of doing climate change alone. So there is, there is quite a lot of synergy in pursuing an integrated portfolio of, of, uh, of goals. And that's, I think, one of the very important findings of the Global Energy Assessment. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. It was a very impressive uh, uh, presentation. My question is, uh, there was a slide that says... Could you please speak just a bit louder? Okay. Um, there was a slide that shows the combined investment ne uh, needs to be in increased from 1.3 trillion to 1.7 uh, for efficiency and supply. Do you know how the breakdown is? How much is for efficiency? How much is for supply? And do you also have it divided by the region, global regions? Uh, the, the answer is yes. Uh, are you going to be here in the afternoon? Yes. Okay, well, there will be a presentation on that, so maybe it's better if you don't mind that we wait until then. Uh, let me just, as a, as a pre-taster, say that most of the investments will be in the developing countries. It's a larger chunk, and, and end use is a critical issue, so I would prefer to come back to that in the afternoon if you don't mind. Hi, um, Bas van Ruijf from the Integrated Assessment Group at NCAR. Um, I was wondering whether you could reflect a bit on how, this, how to get this actually done in the real world. Because I, well, for the instance of, for the example of energy access, I admire your optimism on the modest investment cost. But on the other hand, they are about half of the present day official development assistance. So that's really a huge amount of investments required. So. I was wondering whether you can reflect on that. Well, I mean, I, it is difficult to, to respond to a question like that. I mean, I have to admit, I also have quite lots of depressing thoughts about the future of energy. Uh, but I, I, think the, I think the advantage of global energy assessment, from my perspective, is that it shows that there is an opportunity to do it, that it is doable. Uh, it's, it's not easy, and I think we'll hear from Mark about the policies and others. We need strong policies. We, have a we need a change of paradigm. I think we need really fundamental changes. But I think the, the, the report shows how it can be done. You know, it doesn't tell you what the likelihood is, so it's, it's easy to be pessimistic that there will be delays. Uh, but I think that, for me, the most important uh, proof is that it is doable, and I think it gives an opportunity for the pioneers to start changing. And I think there are already traces of lots of change, electric mobility, lots of renewable investments. Uh, but I think the big, big, uh, this is where I think the crux of the matter will be. The big challenge is how to change the business models. I mean, again, my private view, but derived of the work of, of assessment, is that the business model is somehow wrong. Most of the investment decisions are made for short-term returns, um, uh, returns on capital. Many of the opportunities identified in GEA require long-term investments, very profitable in the long term, but not necessarily in the short term because of the very high upfront costs. How to make that lucrative, I think, is, is going to be the biggest challenge from my point of view. Okay, thanks, Naki. Um, so you've been, you know, traveling around the world now, presenting the results from the global energy assessment, and 
you know, in, in it's, it's really a very controversial message, message, basically. It says, you know, we can have it all. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm wondering, you know, what kind of reception do you get? Do people say, well, thank goodness you've shown that we can do it? Or <clears throat> are they skeptical? Um, yeah, so I'm curious your experience having uh, traveled the world talking about this. Well, I'm not the only one. Other lead authors have done it, so I wonder what their share experiences are. But I, I think there is no simple answer to that. Uh, it, it depends from event to event. I mean, there are a little bit more hostile environments as well. I would say, in general, my experience is people are very polite, and even if they ask a tough question and do not agree with the, with the results, they still frame it in such a way that we can, we can communicate. I think that's really important that we have a dis discussion despite many, many controversies. But but we had, for example, the event we had in Chatham House in in UK it was a great event, about the same size as this one, with lots of discussions, exceedingly controversial, exceedingly controversial. And I think it, it has to be that way. I mean, transformation will be, again, a personal comment, we'll have losers as well, not just those who benefit. I think overall the society would benefit from this transformation, but the inertia is large and there will be people who also tend to lose something. So it's not surprising that there is a controversy. But I think it's important that the change starts occurring, whether we achieve all of the goals of global energy assessment is different, but even if we achieve a part of it, I think it will be a great leap forward. Here. Alexander Ox, also World Watch Institute. Also, my congratulations. I think this is uh, amazing work and it helps us all in our daily work a lot. So my question is uh, uh, very briefly, are you going to update this in two years or in four years or in five years? Because if we look five years back and we've, we look at the trends that happened since then, none of us would have thought this is possible in, in whatever area you look. That's one. The, the second is more a request. Are you going to make the visuals that you're using, the figures, the tables available to everyone? Because I think yeah. it would help us uh, all a great deal. Yeah. Well, first, the, the easy part. Uh, all of it is available on the website, and this afternoon we'll show you also a database with all of the scenarios that you can download. I'll show that in the afternoon, so I will not spend time on it. All of that material is available online. The more difficult question is whether there is going to be post-GEA, so to say, or GEA number two. Uh, I would leave that to my colleagues. I, I'm not sure that I have still energy. I certainly have the motivation, and I think it would be important that there, there would be a follow-up and update, as you you know, shelf life of reports like this is not all that long. I think IPCC has realized that there is also a new attempt to do a millennium ecosystem assessment again in order to bring the fresh information. So with energy, that's why we have so many energy reports. So I think periodic reassessment will be required, but we'll, one would have to see what kind of organizational form and who would be involved. But I hope that many of the authors would be involved. Well, thank you, Naki. I, uh... Uh, I always think that EASA is a unique organization on a global scale uh, to be able to bring this kind of a report together. And as has been pointed out, it's a living report. It's not yeah. like it's a one-shot deal. But I'm uh, interested in going forward. I would think it would be best, or I would, this may be a debated matter during the course of the day today, to select specific topics that are really critical. Yeah at least in different parts of the world, and really focus on those. Yeah. Use this as kind of the foundation, but now you say, okay, now we're going to build, this is where we're going to go here and how we're going to do this. Anyway, that just a question, comment. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree with that and, and support that idea, and I think many of us have been discussing that to produce a series of white papers with individual authors. I think the last analysis I alluded to, I'll show you then the slide in the afternoon, I think it's a, a small event like that, but I think it's important for the authors to get together, maybe even with some reviewers, and update parts of the part of the of the assessment. But if there is an ever a need to do again number two, then I would say as a kind of a self-critique, I was very naive about the financing of an effort like this, so I think some, some smarter people should be involved in it. <laughs> um, yeah, just one thing. So in terms of the report, what are you most uncertain about? You know, it makes lots of you know, recommendations. You know, what are the areas that you really say, 
I'm just not sure about this. Well, I, I don't know. That's also a difficult question. I, you know, I, because I probably know the least about it. I, I think that the, you know, the social, cultural, political dimensions are the ones that I think most difficult and probably have the shortest shelf life of all of it. I think that would be also the reason for redoing the pathways with the new information. I mean, I would put it in that area, but I think energy and use, energy and use together with human behavior, I think it is the most critical part that I think needs revisiting, and Joy Asher will be talking a little bit about lifestyles today. So maybe after her talk, we can, we can take a second crack at that question. Okay, all right, well, thanks.